All righty. Well, it's certainly good to be here. We have been a... Oh, don't, don't worry about that. No, you, I, uh, oh. <laughs> Listen, I haven't been here for 10 years. I got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> it is good to be here. We've wanted to come for many years. I tell you, we were a little taken back when we were checking in, though, because all of a sudden we're having to sign this statement. I think they even notarized it that said that we weren't going to smoke or drink in our rooms, and if we did, we we're going to get a $200 fine. And I'm thinking, Ted, I need to talk to you. I've been sending my grandbabies up here and my, and my family, and what have y'all done as a grace conference to get in the place where we got to sign these statements saying we're not going to drink and smoke in the rooms. I tell you, that was, that was something. And our flight up, you know, I'm from Florida, so my favorite football team is the Florida Gators. Oh, Amen. <laughs> well, at least we got some SEC people in here, so this isn't going to go bad, but... When I'm on the plane, all of a sudden, we have these, I mean, it just seemed to be an overwhelming number of Ohio State people dressed in, coming on the plane, and some sit in front of me, and some sit in back of me, and I'm saying, are they hemming me in? I mean, does it look that obvious that I'm a Florida Gator? <laughs> now, you know, if you know me, you know I don't believe much in the prayer of Jabez, but I tell you, there's a few minutes I was trying to build that hedge around myself. So nobody could see who in the world I was. <laughs> well, we got here without incident, and we praise the Lord for that. Well, you know, my message is about to, to really to rejoice in the Lord, you have to know him. And there's just no, there's no two ends. If we're going to really, really rejoice, it's going to be based on knowledge. I've been studying and studying and studying and trying to figure out how to put this thing together. Finally, my wife, a couple of days ago, she said, well, what do you think? And I says, well, I think I'm, I need to change the title to my message. And she says, change it to what? And I says, well, you know, I've been studying about Jesus and how good it is to know him. I've come to the conclusion that Jesus ain't got no warts. And she says, what? <laughs> I said, Jesus ain't got no warts. And she says, you know, ain't's not a, ain't ain't a word. Now, so now I'm thinking, now, is she just trying to bait me with, uh, with coming back on that? But there is no downside to having a relationship with the Lord which is based on knowledge. Come with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to read the first 14 verses. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I'm more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead." Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this topic tonight, we are so eternally grateful for who we are positionally in Christ, that we're complete, 
We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. There's absolutely nothing that we can do that is going to approve our standing before you. But we realize, too, that we're living today in a sin-cursed world and as yet unredeemed bodies. And there we have an opportunity to make a difference in our joy, in our relationship with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Well, this is a fascinating uh, uh, passage of Scripture to me. Uh, if you've been to uh, any of the men's meeting early, maybe 15 years ago, might even be longer than that now. The first time I really had my eyes open to this passage, Pastor Alex Kurz uh, was teaching it. I've never heard of pastors that impacted me about having a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as that pastor's did. I have been forever changed by that, pass that message. I can't come to this passage now without seeing Alex and hearing these words of encouragement and exhortation. When he says that I may know him, man, what an opportunity we have as a believer. Our opportunity to know the Lord goes way beyond just about uh, knowing him as our Savior. And I trust you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I trust you have come to that place and point in your life where you believe that Christ died for your sins. Can you get any better than that? Well, not this side of glory, except for we're not in glory yet, not in reality. We're here. And I tell you, there's one thing that can revolutionize, change your life. And what, if you find yourself wandering away, once that will give you the motivation, not of fear, not of guilt, not of reprisal, but just that opportunity to rethink about our relationship with the Lord. And that can help get us back on path. But this thing, you know, we, we want to do so. I, I don't know that I've ever talked to a believer who didn't really, on some level, want to have an intimate personal relationship with the Lord. But things get in the way. L-I-F-E. Life gets in the way. Now some things about life we can change, some of the things that we can't change, but the problem with having a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is not life. It's the choices that we make in this life. God doesn't expect us. I, I thought this myself. I, I've been bogged down, you know, entangled with the snare of this world. I've been entangled with all sorts of things. And yet I used to think, you know, I, if I could just get rid of all these things, then I would have more time to have a relationship with the Lord. So what I need to do to get, uh, to get things right is I need to be able just to, maybe, maybe not work. Have you ever thought about not working? <laughs> My wife encourages me, no, go out and work. <laughs> so I say, you know, if it weren't for this life, I could just have a better relationship for the Lord. You know what that is? That is so fatalistic. That's a defeatist attitude. If it just weren't for life. You know, when we're promised and when we're told, we quoted it last night, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Where are we living? In this life we live. And the life which I now live after the flesh, I live after the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We can't just quit life. Amen. But we can enjoy. We can rejoice. We can joy again. And it's in the Lord. It may not be in the circumstances of our life. But when we get beyond just thinking about being burdened and, bar and bogged down, and think about just how wonderful it is to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll put new life into your old life. It'll help bring these things into to do it. You know, it's possible that we may have to rearrange some of our priorities. And that's probably what we don't want. We don't, you know, on one side we want to have this, but on the other side, we really just don't want to make the changes that may be necessary to, uh, to accomplish that. Look at, uh, look at the Philippians chapter 3 uh, and verses 4 through 7. And 4 through 7. He says, Though I m might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, 
I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Paul understood about rearranging priorities, didn't he? He was on the fast t track to religious greatness. He was poised and in perfect position to assume the highest positions in the nation of Israel. But then he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. And his life changed. And he's on that fast track. In Galatians 1, come to Galatians chapter 1, Paul is going to tell them what he learned and what he began to understand. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 13 and 14. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. He says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He says, Man, I understood where it was at. I understood that the things that I had been learning from all the schools and all the places that I'd been, that if I would just pursue the traditions of my fathers, which unfortunately didn't have anything to do with recognizing when Jesus the Christ came and was on this earth, it was out for promotion of them and their values and what they did. But Paul says, man, I was out there. I was doing it. I was more zealous than anyone that I ever knew other than myself, personally, of the traditions of my fathers. But when Paul got saved, he took all those things. He took stock of all those things. He put all those things in, in, uh, into perspective. And he says, you know, they're just not really, they're not where it's at. He found that, you know, when Paul was, Saul, man, he couldn't go anywhere without really people wanting to see him, crowd around him, to exalt him. To, to be with Saul of Tarsus was probably a great privilege. But all of these awards and all the prizes and the notoriety that they gave him added all up together, and Paul came to the conclusion, and I'm sure this was a thought process that he had to go through. It didn't have to be a long thought, thought process. But he just says, you know, they're just not everything that I'd hope. <laughs> See, because the whole time that the Apostle Paul was in the Jews' religion, it was never enough to be where he was at. He wanted to keep going. He wanted to keep climbing because every time he did, he became more notable. But he says here in, verse, uh, in Philippians 3 again, in verse 4, Philippians 3 and verse 4. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he have where he might trust in the flesh, I more. This is the same apostle who's later going to tell us it's not wise to compare ourselves among ourselves. But the, he, he's doing it here for a point. And the point is when you're wrapped up in worldly things, when you're wrapped up in fleshly things, when you're wrapped up in things that are life, it's just a wasted, lost cause. And he says, be careful. Ticking these off. He says, and you couldn't find anyone perhaps with a <clears throat> more notable pedigree than Paul had, Saul had. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, coming from a guy like Saul of Tarsus, but now Paul, Saul is seeing this through the eyes of who he is now, the Apostle Paul. And he says, I knew the law. I understood the law. I, I knew exactly what the, the law was supposed to bring and to accomplish, and I did it blamelessly. <coughs> So he comes along and he says, Paul concluded the accolades of life. Now, some of you may be rich and famous. If you are, I want to talk to you after the service. Because <laughs> i got a plan for your money. But, 
That doesn't apply to many of us around here, does it? We're not rich. We're not famous. You know, apart from uh, knowing a few people in the grace movement, uh, we have no notoriety. We have no recognition. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm okay with that. Because I wouldn't want to be known. I would want people to know the Lord because of me. And if that, if that can be our goal. And I think as we, as we filter down through the message today and tonight, it is that we recognize that it, he, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing of value that we have to give to others. To not only to know them as Savior, but also to know him as our Lord, which Paul's going to get, uh, get to shortly. Remember, Paul's goal is to know the Lord Jesus Christ, verses 7 and 8. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You know, if you went through grade school of the Bible, there's a, there is a, a phrase and a statement that kept coming up over and over again. We talked about knowing the Lord, we, and also as we know the Lord, we're also going to learn more about God, aren't we? And the point is, if, if we want to know what the will of God is, what is God's will for us? We just need to find out what God is doing and then do that. And God has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a desire for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is he desires that his son be preeminent, that he be first place, that, there, that he comes in second to nothing. Um, that's easier said than done. I don't know if you really tried it. I mean, if we're honest, you know, if we want to fool each other, we can, we can say. But because we may fall short, because we may not do it all the time, it doesn't mean that it's any less attainable to us or that it's any less worthy that we pursue something like this. But come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 15 to 23. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. If we spent our days thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and his position, the authority that he has as our head, and that this is what God had, had desired for him. But it goes beyond that in our understanding. It's the same principle, but everything in our understanding. Come to Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 17, he says, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the, the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father, that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father. 
it pleased <laughs> the Father. And can we go wrong in our desires to please God? People say, I want God to be happy with me. Well, exalt his son. And exalt his son in the right dispensation. It doesn't please the Father. It says it pleased the Father that him should all fullness dwell as the head of the church, the body of Christ. It doesn't please the Father today in the dispensation of grace for us to exalt the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love to read and to study the, the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. His faithfulness, his unyielding willingness to minister and to serve. So much we can learn from. But the kingdom of heaven is not at hand. There's nothing that we can do to bring in the kingdom. It doesn't exalt Christ. It doesn't please God. What pleases God is for us to understand what our purpose in, in life is and the stated purpose of God in the revelation of who his son is today and do that. We don't even have to think it up. We sit at home. We sit in churches. We have meetings. What can we do? What can we do? Well, let's figure out how to make the Lord Jesus Christ preeminent and that will please the Father. Come to Philippians chapter 3 again. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3 verse 7 and 8. Philippians 3, 7 8, but what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. <clears throat> you know, I really don't, I know that I listen to, especially on the TV evangelism and whatever, I listen to those who present the gospel and my ear just picks up on some things that just aren't clear. The gospel will be presented most every time if there's any clarity to it at all. And they say, what you, we, you need to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior. You can't make him Lord without him first being your Savior, so that thing is backwards. Now, years ago, when uh, Brother Howe was trying to kick some sense in my head about right division, we used to talk about the, the church that we went to. And I grew up in that church. They loved the Lord. They were pretty evangelistic in their outreach. But they used to say, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Make him Lord of your life. Whatever, whatever things that they would say. And, and I would say, well, how when they say that, we know what they mean. I says, you know, might know what you mean. You've been here all your life. What about that lost man that just walked in today? He's going to think that for him to be saved, he needs to make Jesus Lord of his life. Or he needs to ask Jesus to come into his heart, if he could even figure out how to do that. It's not that. You know, someone who believes they've got to ask Jesus to come into their heart, or if we're not careful, we've taught them not to believe that Christ died for their sins. So we need to be careful. But Paul knows the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, but he says, my goal is to know him as my Lord. That's where our joy is going to come from today. I don't think I can get any happier about knowing him as my Savior. I'm tickled pink over that. You know, to know that heaven is my home, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. You know, I'm glad to know that. Our conversation is in heaven from whence cometh the Lord. But we have, from the moment we're saved to the time that the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, or we pass on into eternity. We can have one goal we can bring and place to mind, and that is to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that's available to everyone that will choose to trust Christ as their Savior. But many will just never grasp the opportunity to do so. In a lot of places, I think that the confusion of doctrine will keep people from being able to see the opportunities that we have. We want to be clear in our terminology and what people believe are expectations 
in life. But no. And what does he say in verse 8? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things lost for the excellency. I mean, there were some pretty nice accolades and prizes Paul had. He said, oh, <laughs> the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Paul really understood that there was a difference in our understanding of Christ as Savior and our Lord. He says, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but, but dung that I may win Christ. You know, but knowing the Lord or God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jehovah, you know, wanting to know him, that's not new to our, our age. This could be done all throughout. Come to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9. Jer cha Jeremiah chapter 9 verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah 9, 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise men glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So you know, it's almost, you almost hear what Paul had to say about that, can't you, in that sentence. Come up with me to verse 3. Because this was not what was going on uh, with the nation of Israel. Chapter 9, verse 3. It says, And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they... Uh, pierce, uh, proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. What was Israel's problem? They did not know the Lord. You think there's anybody in Israel that didn't know about the Lord? I mean the history and the testimony and the, and the miracles and the things that God had did for the nation of Israel. They all knew about God. But he says, they proceed from evil to evil because they do not know me. There's a plea, even back then, says God wants, wants the believer to know him because that is where the power is going to come from. It's because they were struggling because they did not know the Lord. And that is unfortunately, I think, true of us today. If we're not careful, come back to uh, Philippians chapter 3. You know, as we, as we see what the Apostle Paul was really up against, what he was desiring to be a part of, and we see what Paul, he says, I am, I am now going to be a man on a mission. Now, I think we know enough about the Apostle Paul that when he was a man on a mission, he was on a mission. Once he set his mind up, once he set purpose to it, once he figured out where he really wanted to go, he was going. He was going to do this. He says in verse 8, Yea, and doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul wasn't holding that against the Lord, though. He says, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul says, I can put this down. Now, he's not going to win Christ like he just won a race and won a reward. He's talking about having a special relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That I may win Christ, and my opportunity to know Christ in this way is a prize to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> that I may win Christ. And he says, and to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Boy, Paul says, all those things and all that stuff that I knew and that, that I did, he says, I know what it is. 
It's dung. That's all. It's something to be excreted and gotten rid of. It had no purpose, no value. He said, but when I, when I see that, what brought him to the realization of that, no doubt had to be some of what his thinking about his relationship with the Lord could be like. He says, when I realized that I could cast all that off and I could then see my way clear to winning the Lord Jesus Christ, that is that relationship that he had with him, he says, all things are going to fall into place. And he says that I may win Christ, verse 9 and 10, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. But this is where we're going to get to see that he just didn't want to know him as his Savior. This is the part where we're going to get into the mind and the thinking of the Apostle Paul where he says, where I'm going to get to know him as my Lord. And he says in verse 10, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. Every year around Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, you'll hear of somebody who wants to be hung like the Lord Jesus Christ was hung. I've never seen anybody who went through that process that looked like they were enjoying it. No, it's the most somber, spiritual thing. They want everybody to say, look at me, I'm suffering like Christ did. I said, None of y'all ever done that, have you? No. Good. Because they're fools. <laughs> they're idiots. You can't take on the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sufferings that Paul's talking about here, he's not talking about the nails going through his hand. He's not talking about the crown of thorns being jammed on his head. You know how many sins those paid for? None. The fellowship of his suffering was when he was... And uh, was when, the, when God the Father made him to be sin for us. Paul wants to identify with that. Being made conformable unto his death. Well, that's a great privilege and a great opportunity we have. But we can do that too. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You know, as believers today... As believers today, where we, want, where we have the really and the greatest opportunity is to have a relationship with the Lord and identify. We have Romans chapter 6, death, burial, and resurrection. And, we, are, and we, we take place in all of it because of God's design in the dispensation of grace. But what we recognize and we, and we see where we come to it, his resurrection. When the Lord Jesus Christ, as God the Son, manifest in the flesh, was walking on the face of this earth, he was a man. He was tempted like we were, praise God, yet without sin. But when he was raised from the dead, he was the first fruits of them that slept, and that temptation was gone. It'll never be. And Paul wants to identify with the resurrected life of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he too can say, I have, because of my identity with the Lord Jesus Christ, I too can have victory and power over sin. When Paul talks about living, he's not just thinking about living at the, in the end, at the rapture. You know, the best time to live is now. We ask the question often, when does eternal life begin? The moment that we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. The moment we by faith believe that when Christ died at Calvary, he paid 100% for my sin. And at that moment, God says to me and to you and to all others, I give you the gift of eternal life. Paul says, 
we don't only worry about the life which is to come. What's really is, import, is important is how we live the life that now is. And we can identify and we can, we can rejoice in the fellowship of uh, what Paul is rejoicing in and fellowshipping with. The fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. There's some expectations that we have from that. Verses 9, I mean verses 10 and 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Now look what he says here. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection from the dead. I remember years ago reading some th thoughts that other people had to say on this verse. Their conclusion was, if Paul wasn't sure about his soul salvation, how can you be sure of yours? Their point was going to be that the only way you could be sure was if you did something other than just believe. But Paul says, if any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, and my question is, then, and it is now, and is if God, when he put the plan of salvation together, he had a purpose in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that was apart from where we're going to spend eternity. And that when the Apostle Paul says that I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, he says right now, in this moment, in this part of my life, while I'm still waiting on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to come and to catch this church away, he says I want to attain to the resurrection of the dead. I want my life to be representative of the power of the glorified Lord Jesus Christ and his life living in me. I say, well... Paul wasn't wondering where he's going to spend eternity. Paul was wanting to say, how am I going to live the rest of my life while I'm waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back? But he's careful. He wants to come back and he wants to put this into perspective. He's careful and he wants everybody to know because you make a statement like that and somebody's going to be watching you and waiting for you to slip up and fall. So he's careful. And he says in verse 12, not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect. This is how we know he's not talking about positional truth. He's talking about practical truth. I mean, how, how much more complete could Paul get than what you and I could get? He couldn't, could he? How much more blessing with all spiritual blessing? He, he, there just wasn't. He says, I have not attained to my desire to identify with the resurrected life of the Lord Jesus Christ, not as though I'd already attained. Either were already perfect in that, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Here's a, here's a great message for any believer. God didn't save us so we could wallow around in the filthy uh, losses of life the disappointments of life. He didn't, he didn't save us for that. There's so much damage that can be done to the testimony of the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ and his life living through us that's going to be, the light's not going to shine so bright. Many times unbelievers, even denominational believers, they're going to look at us and say, you're preaching this message of grace How's it working? We want to see you, even if you don't believe God's putting money in your bank account, even if you do not believe that God is going to divinely intervene and heal your loved ones, even if you don't believe that God is going to somehow miraculously fix the failures of our own life, which we don't have any promises of, he just gives us the ability to work through those. But they're going to look at us and they're going to say, how are you doing in life? Because they're going to tell you they're doing great. They're not going to be doing great. 
but to rejoice in the Lord. To be so identified with the Lord Jesus Christ that it would be impossible to distinguish his life from our life. And to know him is the key and the opportunity that we have. You know, a life where the control and the effects of sin and living in a sin-cursed world <laughs> don't get us. Now, what are the chances that we'll live from tonight on and never make a mistake again? <laughs> I used to have people tell me, though, well... It may be possible, but it's not going to be probable, and therefore if it's not probable, why worry about it? I said, well, I just don't know that we've understood exactly the opportunity. Paul's motivation, which can be our motivation, if the result of us trying to apply his idea of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ to our life, Causes us to wake up in, uh, with guilt. We've not been looking at it right. The greatest thing that we can do when we find ourselves living contrary to what grace and what the grace principles of life bring is to stop doing the one thing and to start doing the other. Grace reigns. The system of grace flows. There's energy and power in the system of grace. The, the power, it has the power to overcome the frailties of the flesh, to overcome the weaknesses of our mind, and to help us. See, we don't have to make Jesus Lord of our life because he is, whether we acknowledge it or not. But the power and the strength of grace flowing through our veins, flowing through our mind, and the, and, the, and the Word of God comes to us. And all of a sudden, we see it's possible. I believe it's not only possible, but if we are thinking like that, it will be probable. All the way up until we start thinking poorly again. There is no downside to having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You work for somebody and you tell them, I want to do this, I want to do that, and they say, well, you've got to do more, and 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 all of a sudden the task is such a great burden that you can't do it. Well, I want to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to have an intimate and personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to know Him and the power of of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be made conformable unto his death. I want to attain to that. I want to apprehend that for which I have been apprehended of Christ Jesus my Lord. And God says, we got that covered. You buy into my system, it'll work. So as we think about all that's going on, Paul talked about the failures of the past. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. How many people think that Paul said, I'm going to forget, and he never, didn't he know he did it? He just forgot completely. No remembrance at all. Didn't happen, did it? God didn't make us to be forgetters. He directs us on how to remember. Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press to the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, in essence, he says, I just replaced one thought with the other. <laughs> I've got a new goal. The failures of the past. Now, Paul's could have been many, many. We have failures of the past. There's no value in just continually bringing those failures of the past up over and over again and thinking you're going to have more strength to overcome it next time. But reaching forth, very positive, 
very empowering, very encouraging, very doable in Christ Jesus. Rejoice where? In the Lord. We are in the Lord the moment we trusted Christ as our Savior. We can rejoice in the Lord. And I suspect that if there's one being whose desire matches ours for wanting to know him, it would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we can't exalt him any greater than that. To tell and to commit our life to exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. That's a privilege. Let's pray. Father, again, we are so thankful for who we are in Christ. We're thankful for the life of the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ living in us. Our prayer is that when we get bogged down and entangled with the affairs of this world, that our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, his life will shine through and help us break that bondage and get right back on track. We give you the praise and glory for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.